Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is the Wix Online Meeting 197, first day of October of this 2020. These meetings are recorded for those of you that aren't with us right here, right now. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the other slide. If you're here, say hi. Uh, it's good to see Jacobs here in Iswix, which I think is painter. Christopher Painter, good to see you guys. Welcome. Uh, what are we doing today? We're doing triage, because we are always doing triage, um, assuming there's something to triage, and there is some today. And then we're going to pick up some Wix v4 design discussions that have uh, stalled out an email. One, because we've been kind of going round and round in email, and probably talking about it in person is the way to do it anyway. And hopefully it just takes less time to resolve these things. So I think we have four of them open for today. I don't know how many we will get through. We might get through three or four of them. We'll see. Um, and then we will... Um, uh, do the usual questions and comments, things that other people want to bring up. So, Bob, you ready? Let's go do triage first. No. No? Yeah, he's been waiting to do that for years. <laughs> it, it has been years, hasn't it? <laughs> yep. All right. Anyway, I'm going to the web. Hopefully you're okay. ready to type. Sure. Um, Wix 311 doesn't include 2019 SDK. Um this is expected because of the expectations that you can use the 2017 libraries, right? Um, well, I think the answer to that, well, no, it's not expected because it's compatible. It's expected because we you know, stopped updating uh, Wix 3 for, for uh, the latest Visual Studio. 3.11 and 3.14 use Visual Studio 2017. 2017. That's right. Now, it happens to be the case that yes, you should be able to use um, the 2017 libraries. So right. that's a happy coincidence. Yeah, great. So that's the solution to that, I guess. Yeah. Um, do we condition out the 2017 to only be installed when we find 2017? It wouldn't surprise me if we do something like that. Say that in a different way so that I understand. In the bundle, do we only install the 2017 SDK if the 2017, um, 2017 is installed? Yeah, yep, yeah, probably. Probably, because that would be something uh, very uh, time-saving that we would do for those people that had only 2015 on their machine when Correct. that was written. Um, so that is a good point. I suppose we could take this as... Uh, thing to always install the 2017 native SDK yeah. or even to completely dump the conditioning? I don't know if we want to start installing 2015 if you don't have 2015 installed. Or 2010? Or 2010. I mean, yeah, all the others. Yeah. Right? Because those were not as backwards compatibility, right? It wasn't 2017 where the C++ team finally said, hey, you know your libraries here are going to work for a little while? Or is that just luck? And I'm imagining that it was... No, no, that was... It was stated. That right? was an explicit goal. Right now, it, it's it's been, it's, yeah, it's unclear that they, you know, mean to right. extend that indefinitely. But All right. so, hmm, okay. Um, and Painter says he sees it there on his machine. I haven't looked. I'm trusting this person. Actually, knows what they are talking about. Um, oh, I see. You see the 2017, and you only have 2019 installed. Okay. Oh, actually, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I'm just looking at the bundle, and there's no install condition on the native SDK MSIs. Oh, great. So we didn't do what I said, and we're all set then. Yeah, I'm thinking we had that for votive, not for the native SDKs. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yes, well, especially for votive because it was different for each. Yeah. Yeah. And All right. That goes away with 311. That's fantastic. We don't have to fix anything then. The answer is yeah. use the 2017 libraries, and there is already a change. I don't know if we've made it or not. Um, no, we're going a different way in four, but there is already a mess that they were laid out with VS 2017 or like the Visual Studio year number in them instead of being laid out as 
uh, what was it, 140 or XP and 141, like the way that the, uh, what they call platform tool sets were, we should have done that pivot, but we didn't because of backwards compatibility. And now that we're going to be distributing all our libraries through NuGet, hey, we get to avoid all that problem completely. Well, not completely. We have to do the platform tool set mapping in the NuGet, but anyway. Um, it'll be better and easier, and the answer to this is, um, yeah, just use 2017. That's great. Um, driver installation on ARM does not work, and this is the fix app? Yeah. This app never supported ARM64 nope. and, and is now deprecated. So. Yeah, I really wish Microsoft would give us the code, which I've said many times before. Um, yeah, unfortunately, this has to go to the Microsoft team, and maybe he can join some uh, list that says, hey, please donate that code so that they'll maintain it on things. Well, maybe we'll maintain it. We could at least look at it and try to figure out if we can maintain it, um, or at least build it for ARM64, assuming it even works. Anyway, um, this is missing the custom actions, which come from Microsoft, and we don't have them. ROM 64. Yep. So, boo. Do we need a better air? We're not going to get a better air in three. Do we need a better air in four? We've talked about this before on these architectures. Well, so the Diffix app is, is, you know, the odd case, right? Because they it's didn't. We can't provide, yeah. We, yeah, we can't include it in the Wixlib because they didn't differentiate the custom action IDs by platform. Uh, so you have to supply an additional Wixlib. Now, you know, the fact the the Wixlib is named Diffix App X64, um, mm. I would have hoped would have been enough of a clue that it you know, wasn't going to be ARM compatible. But because we can't differentiate by custom action ID, I don't think we can catch this at build time. Right. Unless our driver extension did something to say, hey, did you know I didn't support ARM64? But you'd have to be building with the platform set that way, which you'd have to do anyway. I guess we could catch that in the extension itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I think so. Let's toss that in 4.0 and see if it pobbles up to the top to add an error to say, um, Microsoft never provided an ARM64 build of this. Go here <laughs> to ask them to provide it. I have no idea where to tell them to go. I don't either, but... Except metaphorically. Metaphorically, yes. Go ask Microsoft is kind of the answer. Yeah. All right, cool. Burn does not pass restart flags to related bundles. I saw Sean was already um, engaging on this one. Sean, any thoughts? I I think we'd have to make sure that this actually works. Yeah. Uh, I get that we want to pass the switches, but we'd have to make sure it actually works and is backwards compatible. Yeah, I, I this comment here I think makes some sense is that it'd be like um always pass no restart and if the bundle says it needs a restart, then the parent bundle should, if the child bundle says it needs a restart, then the child bundle, sorry, if the child bundle says it needs a restart, then the parent bundle should respect that. Oh, no. Related bundles are run. Uh, will that get reported back to the parent? I guess it will. It ends up as another package. Right. So it should get, chain. It should get reported back to the parent, so it could do the right thing based on the exit code, right? Yeah, theoretically. I just don't, I guess the uh, point I was trying to make is, I don't know if it's as easy as adding the switches and we're done. Uh, I think that's fair. And I'm also concerned to your point, Sean, about backward compatibility. Yeah, this is something we take in four, right? If it works, yeah. If it, I'm worried well, about it. Breaking compatibility in three. I mean, the I think the compatibility problem would be the related bundle that you're calling, not yourself. Also fair. So, it's yeah, this is yeah. We should we, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we might have we might have 
something to think about just in terms of um, in four, a uh, parent bundle calling a related bundle built with three. That deserves some, you know, attention. Basically. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But four is where we have to fix it. So. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm. I'm just saying uh, there might be even more work when we start looking at at fixes like this. So where do we put this? I mean, yeah, we put in four. Okay. And walk through all the implications of it. This, I guess I was just trying to point out that this isn't a normal breaking change that, yeah, we just do in four, don't worry about it. Yeah, agreed. Mm -hmm. I think the logic is sound. I think it should work, but I absolutely agree. We need to step through everything. All right. Well, yeah, especially <laughs> my memory don't even remember the waste bundles. Chance I remember all the pieces of burn plus... That's why I'm glad we have Sean here to kind of think through the more esoteric parts of this. So that's good. All right. I think that's all of these things. This goes to four. This goes to four. And this, sorry, 6252 goes to four. 6251 goes to four with the hope we can add a better error message. Um, pointing people at Microsoft. And then 6250 is essentially resolved as, yeah, I use the 2017 libraries. It's a little weird, but. That's where you get them from. Cool. All right. So, uh, Wix for design discussion, now that triage is done. Um, we have a few of these to talk about. Um, and uh, Sean gave them to me them in an order, and I changed the last two because I think I may need the ability to draw and write things for the last one, six, two, and nine, and I'm not sure I have all that configured here, so we'll see if we get to that one um, on top of all the other ones. Um, but I think we might, um, given that these first three, I'm not sure are gonna be that hard for us to resolve. So I thought I would bring up the the whip, Sean, and then uh, we could, maybe you could refresh us on what's left open for us to decide, and then we can discuss from there, cool? Okay, yeah. All right, so the um, string versions was all related to semantic versioning support inside burn um, and the getting rid of uh, or moving away from keywords, which are storing the four dot uh, versions, the old, good old 65,000 whatever, um, and moving to a string thing that would support that four dot version still and that would also enable us to um, support other formats, namely semantic versioning being the other um, one that's uh, well known. And the purpose here is to allow Burn to rationalize these versions. We, of course, can't teach MSI to handle semantic versioning, but at least the Burn engine can start doing them um, and doing smarter things. So that's the background of what this is for. What's the remaining issue, Sean? Um, the remaining issue was we were talking about like the um, handling the bad versions, right? Like, so um, I ended up coming up with a specification for what a valid version actually is. So um, that's down here somewhere. What the update for the the update for the whip like added all these points inside of that very util version specification. So a lot of that wasn't there before. It kind of just pointed back to NuGet. But since it's now our own spec, I tried to actually write out all the, of the rules actual here. rules. Yeah. And I tried to give like an example of here's a valid one, here's a invalid one. We're gonna test my understanding of what's valid semantic. So the whole plus thing is ignored, right? Um... So I got so there's now there's like a strict mode in Veryutil, and there's a non-strict mode. 
Okay. And so burn is always going to use the non strict mode. So if you have two versions that were parsed correctly, like they were valid versions according to the spec, then yes, after the plus, it's going to ignore mm -hmm. the build metadata. Right. Because but if, if one of the versions was not valid, then I put in a thing in here that says, well, I guess, are we going to read through them or are we, am I summarizing? <laughs> I think you can summarize. I mean, the goal here is to essentially be four dot versions as we had before, although able to go much larger now. What's this? Is this a long? For yeah. each dot? It's an unsigned oh, it's, long. But, right, it's a D word, right. Okay, yeah. Or so, it, yeah, right. An unsigned long for each of these, right? Which is each, great. Yeah. Um, and yeah, all these negative numbers aren't valid, and a five dot is not valid, and I assume that's like one number too high. Yeah, right. All right, so that's four dot version. That's what everyone's going to normally expect when dealing with Windows installer. It all worked as it did before. That's very simple. I, the next ones you've lay out here are these all. This is Semver, essentially, right? Yeah, it's essentially Semver. Um... The difference is, well, yeah, two and three are just simpler. Yeah. And then we start getting into the non strict of when you can start um, comparing things. <laughs> that should be enough for a version. Um, famous yeah, so, so, like, number five, like, we're restricting it to the size of a we're restricting the size of the string, like in our spec. We're allowing to start with me, yep. which is something we allow. And then, yep. yeah, the precedence rules are a little different because we're we're using v3 rules for the if it's a normal just four dotted version. But then, yeah, that's when things get complicated after that. So, yeah. like, if a version was invalid and you're comparing it to a valid version, well, in step one, you compared what you were able to parse. So you can see that 2.0.1 negative one is greater than 1.0 because it was able to successfully parse the initial 2.0. But if they were both like, if the four dotted version was the same, then this next thing would kick in where if it was an invalid version, it'd automatically be considered less than the valid version. And that's kind of something to think about is where we actually slot this comparison. Like when do we start saying, all right, here's where an invalid version is automatically less. Because theoretically, we could have gone on and compared the pre-release uh, labels. And then after that, looked at whether the actual version was valid or not. So the thing I'm thinking about, like, this zero zero compared to garbage. Um, is I mean, I'd be like, yeah, okay, fine. A valid version is greater than an invalid version. But when we get to like the next one, where zero zero is greater than this, um, if this is a typo or a mistake, the fact that there's no error here is going to be really hard to track down. Even this, right? This like this could be, you know, the word foo. Right, where someone thought they were putting the variable in there, but they, you know, forgot the square brackets or whatever, and now they compare 0, 0 0.0 to foo, and then it's, you know, never true, um, or it's always true. Um, the characters foo, which are an invalid string. That's the one thing I'm worried about: not parsing versions with errors. 
because it's really easy to typo something like this and not find it for a very long time, like these two dots. Well, and you have to you have to be not in strict mode for it not to be an error. Right, but did you say burn was in non-strict mode? Yeah, so, yeah, burn doesn't use strict mode. That's what because I'm worried about. Like, because uh, that's kind of the issue that started this whole thing. Like, the bundle can't just completely give up if it can't parse the version. And that's the only thing you can do if you're if you want an error from parsing the version, then you're back to square one where <laughs> burn can't do anything anymore. I mean, we can write to the log every time that happens if we want. A warning in the log that says, hey, we hit an invalid version. We saw yeah. an invalid version. Mm -hmm. That that at a minimum that sounds like we would need to do that. Um, because this could be some really, really subtle bugs. Um In conditions today in burn, don't you have to start with a V? Otherwise, it treats it like a string. Like we don't do duck typing where we're like, oh, it looks like a version, so I'll convert it to a version, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure in, yeah, in conditions, you have to prefix it with a V. So, if, mm -hmm. so I did have to change the parsing code for conditions to where it has to be like a space to separate the tokens. So like before in a condition, you could leave out the space between the token, the version and the comparison. But now because we allow any character, you have to, it has to be a space to, com to separate the version and the comparison or in the next token. I don't know if that's a good idea either. I, I see the problem, but I don't know if that's a good idea. I mean, because if you're in a condition, then you're just what, are you guessing that it's a version then? Well, I mean, you still have to prefix it with a V. Oh, but then then why do you need a space if you know there has to be a V? Well, it's like V, it has to be V, and then it has to be a digit. And then in order to know when the version actually ends, you have to look for a space. Uh, because equals and all those things can be considered part of. Uh, uh, that's that's gonna that's gonna catch people. The the comparator is very often going to end up being part of the version. There none of the comparison operators show up in normal semver separators, right? It's a dash or a plus. There's no like equals as a separator or anything, right? Or right. less than or anything like that. So it just turns into, are you allowed to have less than and such like that as the, oh, the metadata at the end of things. Does Semver allow any character in the metadata? Like, no. It doesn't allow less thans and greater thans and things like that. It's just A through Z, zero to nine, plus, minus, dot. Dot. Those are the only 
things of loud and simple and uh, in ours. Sorry, and what was that? In well, ours. I mean, it, it, yeah, in our okay. formal it, specification. Right. Now, I, I might have actually restricted it to those characters when parsing out. I can't remember. I'd have to go and look. I don't think there was an easy way for me to do that. I'm really worried about there having to be a space after a version, though. Um, that is a very easy thing to just not do and then get really weird behaviors. Um, so I, I'm, I'd, I'd almost like be like, look, this line noise like is not a version. Um, then I, I'd almost say, look, you can't put these characters in and expect us to parse it as a version. It's just not part of the version. To when you because versions are compared quite often, and expecting people to remember to put a space after the version always to prevent it from becoming part of the metadata of the left hand side of the comparator is that's that's just going to be. I mean, I'm going to get hit by that. I imagine very easily too even knowing the rule or knowing that. And then when seeing it going, what? Oh, right, there's that thing. That's just going to get me. Am I alone? Like, Bob, you're like silently letting it roll. Um, I'm, I'm letting you two have fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we probably could change it to look for something that's not A to Z, zero to nine, plus minus dot. Yeah, I, I, I think guess supporting SEM... I think like, I was trying to get input before I wrote that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like most of that line noise, if that was parsed and it's like, this is never a valid version, I think I'd be completely comfortable with that, knowing that those characters are never allowed in SEMVR, right? SEMVR, let me put this another way. Um, four dot versions are grand, we're very comfortable with them. We've been doing them forever. It's what Windows has built into it from the beginning of time. Okay, that's easy. Semver opened up the space bigger, and then parts of the Microsoft ecosystem started adopting it, most predominantly NuGet, but um, a lot of other places are starting to pick it up for their software as well, or at least supporting it. So expanding our four-dot world to be able to also include Semver is, I think, is, is a good thing. That's where this comes from going to the point where we can accept any arbitrary set of characters as a version is maybe a step too far if it has the impact on making us do our comparisons really painful, right? So it's like, yeah, you know what? You can never use any comparison operator. The tilde, equal, greater than, less than, any of those kinds of things. Um, and they've already taken minus and plus, so we're not going to be doing math on versions anytime soon either, because that's going to have the same sort of problems. Um, but fortunately, math on versions is not very common, um, in our, at least in our space, but comparisons are. So if we said that anything with those characters in it is not part of the version token, then I'd be like totally, f basically treating those as token breakers. Um, I would be totally fine. White space, of course, is included and things like that. Yeah, that's fine. I think, I guess the reason I did it the way I did it because it was easy. <laughs> and if we're going to do it some other way, then we would need to agree on the character space that we were going to allow. I, I agree. I agree with that. Um, and I think calling out the comparators is hopefully I don't think anybody would argue with us. Right. And then no, there are no third party libraries that do this already because I believe our version four part version thing is kind of unique. 
Well, Nougat yeah. used to do it, or still does it in a certain mode, um, but, right? But they, they have... don't. They have different. They don't treat undefined fields as zero. So, like one dot two dot three dot zero is bigger than one dot two dot three. Oh, that's Nougat. right. And it makes no sense. And people could yes. I've seen people, tons of people complaining about that because it makes no sense. You are exactly right, and that is busted. <laughs> that be, that's so busted. Undefined, because in a version, C-sharp version, undefined is negative one. And that's why that works that way. I've seen that code before. Um, and it felt lazy to me that it's undefined, so we'll just use what C-sharp version does and say it's different. Um, right. But it, it just doesn't – I don't know how you in the real world say 1.2 is different from 1.2.0.0. Am I crazy? Like, is that is that right? Like, 1.2 is the same as 1.2.0.0. And yeah. 1, 1.2 is just what everybody says because saying dot zero dot zero is annoying, and everybody knows. Yeah, it's the zeros. Of course it's zeros. What else would it be defaulted to? Negative 1. What? No! <laughs> Version numbers don't go negative, um, which is why you can use the separator dash in semver because version numbers never go negative. Um, it is different if the invalid fluff at the other end versus positions. Pondering if there are people who trail their version with a SHA with a pound. Well, not. I've never seen a version that had a pound at the end of it. Um, so, yeah. So I, I think I, I understand what you're saying. Is you, you're trying to not say what characters were invalid. Um, I think at a minimum we could say the invalid characters are the comparison operator characters. The comparison operator characters. Is that operator characters, whatever. The characters that make up, you know, think greater than equals. Now, interestingly, tilde's in there, but that's really only for strings, right? Because it's the case insensitive. Yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to go back and look at the code and see if that's something that versions use. Yeah, I'm... But I mean, I'd be fine with restricting it A to Z, zero to nine, plus minus. What what Semver does, right? To Jacob's point with the SHA hash, is there any advantage of that? I haven't seen that as a standard out there. The is hash it? would just be another metadata noise. I mean, the plus remind me, plus is metadata already um, in the structure. Yeah, so I've seen that where it's there's a plus and then the you know some abbreviation of the of the hash of the commit hash. Oh right, like plus SHA and then some hash, or just plus and then the hash or whatever. Yep. Yeah. Right, but it's not it's not <laughs> it's not hash mark hash. Sorry, it's not the um, Octothorpe. Yes, I was, try, I was trying to remember its um, official name. Um, all right, I, I think that's the the important part is to get the conditional characters out of there, and then I I'm fine with the trimming it down to what Semver supports as well as the numbers that break the the characters that break version numbers. Um, into these fields. Now, the next question is if we're doing non-strict, so, all right, great. So that solves that part of the discussion around all of these characters. This double dot typo concerns me still. Um, as an invalid string comparison, well, I guess, all right, so let's say we did it strict, 
then that would result in an error. Um, and then burn would say that this version is an error, the condition is an error, and then it resolves to either zero or um, true or false in that case anyway, right? So, uh, let's see. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. That's a that's fantastic, and that's a perfect example of something to that would be parsed into the metadata. Sean, do you see there's Jacob's? Not, there's, there's not supposed to be two pluses. That's not legal. Two pluses is not legal? I thought anything after the plus was ignored. No. No. It's it's just like the release labels. It's supposed to be. There's only supposed to be um, one. No, like you can have, yeah, there's only supposed to be one plus. <laughs> and then everything after that is supposed to be the legal characters, like A, A through Z, zero through nine, minus dot. Right. So if there are either one of those plus parts are correct, but not both of them. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I mean, if we need to change the spec to allow multiple pluses, that's fine. <laughs> but the, under Simver 2, that's not a valid Simver 2. I don't have strong opinions on multiple pluses or not. Um, I, I think... mean, it's, it's a good thing to bring up, like, we can easily add that. It's yeah. not hard. Just yeah. something that I didn't think about. Yeah. I... <laughs> yeah. Two pluses. Um... I don't have a strong opinion on that one. Because it's still with... All those characters are still within the allowed... Or the, the set of characters that are allowed. Um, the number of them. They're not going to be mistaken for a conditional character, I guess, is the important part. So I don't have a strong opinion on that one. It's almost like if you hit the plus sign, in their case, you hit the plus sign, then you get into the rule of it can be any of those characters, including another plus sign is what they've done there. They don't, second plus is not considered more metadata, it's just part of the the, I guess specifically the metadata is everything from that G until the final two. I think they're adding two pieces of metadata. I think that's what they're doing, but yeah. You can also look at it as everything after the plus is just metadata. Yep. Until you hit a non-allowed character of all the characters in Simber, which are the ones you listed. Mm-hmm. Um, that plus doesn't get evaluated as part of the version anyway, right? It's carried, but it's not. If you do a comparison, that is not considered in the comparison, right? It's, it's only the release labels that are, the, the, the minus before the pluses. Yeah, in strict mode, it doesn't matter what's after the plus. Right. But I bet most implementations mm -hmm. just, you know, plus till the end of string is ignored. Yeah, probably what they do. Well, I mean, I think NuGet would restrict it to the characters. Like, they wouldn't just stop reading the string. They would verify that they're valid characters. And then I think they do have a special sorting mode where they will actually compare. Like, if they're showing you all the packages, all the versions for a package, mm -hmm. I think they will sort it lexicographically. But oh, that's right. not... That's that's just about NuGet, is what you're... I was just making a general comment about, you know, some of implementations, not necessarily NuGet. NuGet probably does a more thorough job, I would agree. 
Well, and if you're displaying them, I could see you using the release metadata to sort them stably or you know whatever in the UI. But yeah. if you if you do a comparison between the two versions, it's the dotted parts and then the the what's it called release labels? Is that what you call it? Release labels, which are the dashed parts before the plus. Right. And then the plus is just yeah, you could put stuff here. We ignore it for all intents and purposes. We just carry it for you. And you can do something beautiful like, you know, display it if you want to. But if you have two if you have two invalid versions, then it the logic can eventually get to the point where it's comparing the metadata to figure out which one's greater or less than. But that's kind of an odd case to be in. And it, that then it's lexicographic. Then the comparison is using the release metadata lexicographic lexicographically the same way it does the labels. Right. I'd have to defer to what Semverse says to do there. I, my last reading, which was a long time ago, was that everything after that plus sign was ignored for all purposes. Well, it's, well the problem with invalid versions is like it's going to parse as much as it can, and then it's going to throw the rest into the metadata. So if you have, if you start with an invalid character or, you know, the whole string could be the metadata basically. Right. I see. So then it would be essentially zero unless you compared the metadata of things that are considered invalid by any of the rules that we know. Right. And the plus is required for switching to metadata. So like yeah. Jacob's thing of 2.1.0.unknown hash, like that would be considered an invalid version. And everything would be tossed to metadata? No. Only It'd the... Be be major two, minor one, and then it would have metadata of unknown hash. That's pretty good. But if you compared that to 2.1.0 plus unknown hash, it would not be equal because the dot unknown hash is an invalid version and to be considered less. Right. Invalid is less than valid. I think burn, because we are doing comparisons, I think burn at least needs to log about invalid versions. Um, and, oh, sorry, if two valid versions are invalid, then there it's all the rules and metadata is lexicographically compared as well. Right. right. So if I have 2.1.0. unknown hash, it is less than 2.1.1 invalid hash. Right. right. They're both invalid versions, but they will end up comparing correctly because the 2.1.1 was compared higher than the 2.1.0. Right. And I think in burn, if we spit out, a, we have to at least spit out a log message saying, hey, we found what is an invalid um, version, then you can just know that we need to say that so that someone knows that the comparisons on that version are going to be um, not what they would expect with things that are valid versions. And also, I don't think it will happen very often in burn outside of four dot versions and semver because those have rules and everything that's invalid has rules that we don't know what the rules are playing by. So we're just picking the logical things and going on from there, which is valid is better than invalid, and invalids compare um, 
lexicographically past what we can recognize as a typical 4. Dot version. Right? Yeah, so the only question that's open is at what point do we look at the invalid flag? So like I put it between the four dotted versions and the release labels. But theoretically, we could have put it up front before comparing the version numbers. We could have also put it after the pre the pre-release. But I thought Sorry, it made more. I, I missed that. The invalid versions are you is at four, right? So all of so one, two, and three are all valid versions, right? Sorry, where are you? Uh, in the spec. Sorry, I'm on the stream. I'm in the ver usual so version. I'm trying I'm to figure out where it is. I'm talking about the precedence rules. Mm -hmm. I have precedence rules one, two, three, and four. Oh, precedence rules. And is that here? It, ah. It's. Am I not so, seeing? It? I'm not seeing that called out. Uh, it's at the bottom of the version util, ver util version specification. Yeah, okay. The last one. Oh, precedent rules. Mostly followed NuGet. Got it. Make sure so my this, first. Yeah, one, two, Got three, it. four. And number two is where do we put that? Um, I understand. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking it's a well-worded question. Um, so when I said it before, I think I said invalid is always less than valid. So I moved the precedent rule number two to the top. But then in your example that you were talking about with Jacob's version, you put it after. Like you were saying it as I wrote it, that 2.1.0.unknown hash would be less than 2.1.1.unknown hash. Sorry, I was saying is... that invalid, right, but in my case, 2.1.1.invalid hash and 2.1.0.invalid hash, both of those are invalid because they used a dot to separate oh, the release yeah. label. So that's how I got to, the first rule was they're both invalid, therefore we go through the precedence rules. Um, if one was valid, if it had been 2.1.0 compared to 2.1. invalid hash with the way I said it, and I hadn't thought this all the way through, the 2.1.0 would have been higher. So now I'm looking at your, your precedent rules here, um, and I'm debating whether the release label, whether two, the invalid flag should move below the release labels or not. Because I like the major, I think I like the major patch, major minor patch revision comparison first, just like burn v3. Yeah. The question is, do we accept the release labels at the same level of precedence as those four dots before then moving on to invalid? Uh, stuff. And I think I put it here because I was afraid that people were going to put like invalid characters in the release labels or something. So I thought it would be if you have an invalid version, the most likely reason for that is you put invalid characters in the release labels. So then it's like we have like maybe one version had no invalid characters, the other one had invalid, but it's entirely possible that it should have actually been higher. So I guess that's what I was trying to avoid. And that's why I put the invalid flag above the release labels. You didn't want to do label comparison on labels that are technically invalid as if, you know, that are, sorry, that are, that are invalid. <laughs> yeah, didn't want to compare 
release labels that were invalid. Well, that could have, yeah. Like, maybe, maybe we should add something where, like, internally we know whether we s successfully parsed the release labels. Like, if if the problem was an invalid character in the metadata, then we can compare the release labels and know that. It makes sense. But if the problem in parsing was in the release labels, then maybe we shouldn't even try to compare them at all. At a certain level, though, isn't a problem in the release label now just a means it terminates parsing the release label? It's like, hey, you hit a less than. Like, okay, the release label is everything before that less than. You know, it's or, you know, it's an equals. You're like, all right, cool. It's not that going back to the, there's no required space between, you know, space is not the breaker. It's a non-valid release label character is now the breaker. So you, you would end up with a release label. And then if you hit an invalid character, you're like, nope, that's the end of the version. Whatever comes after that is, you know, either a comparison operator greater than, less than, equals, those kind of things. Or it's, you know, gobbledygook that is then fails to be parsed as a condition. Well, we're kind of talking outside of conditions right now, though. Just. Well, I, I keep bringing up conditions because they're the most wide open and they have the most, they're the case where people type the most, I think, um, the, where people will type and put the most uh, mistakes in. I do think that where we have like the the burn version field, right? We've appropriately cordoned that thing off and we can read it because we know exactly how long it is. Um, and so that I, I keep bringing up condition because it's the more open-ended one and has the most chance for humans to accidentally put in the wrong thing and we need to well, help them get to the right answer or what they meant. Well, the, well, the thing is, is that they put gobbledygook in the string for the condition, they're just going to get a, it's going to fail to parse the condition string itself. They're not even going to get it, get into comparisons. Actually. Right, right. Right. So that's my point is that a release label an an invalid release label is an invalid release label. When you hit a character that would make a release label invalid, that's the end of the release label. But I mean, today, the the thing that started this issue is Burns reading versions from the registry. So. All right. So if you I'm can read. All right. All right. All right. All right. Got, got you. Got you. Got you. Right. So you're, you're talking about the. No, I do know. I do have to parse this whole string as a version. Got it. Right. You're going to the other one that I consider the easier case. But because it's easier, as in, you know, here's the full version. Here are the. You have to get through characters that may be in that full version that are bad. Okay, got it. All right, I've caught up. Um, yes, so then you would have an... In, all right, that's, a, that's an, an easy way to get into an invalid version. Okay. I don't have a strong opinion on two and three, given that. I, 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 I can go either way with it. Is comparing release labels with invalid data worse than declaring the entire version invalid? And I, mean, I, guess I almost want to compare the release point? labels for. <laughs> um, like, at what point do you acknowledge that you have garbage in? you stop trying to compare it to something that you know is valid. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And that is the question that we're debating here. And I like the first rule, and I am debating whether rule three should move above rule two. That it's like, yeah, yeah, you know, the release label has 
non-correct characters in it, but that's okay. We're just going to do lexicographical comparisons anyway, so, you know, whatever. It could be anything. You're still marked invalid. And then after that, now you're invalid. So a valid, now if they're still equal, a valid version is better than a invalid version. What that would do is allow you to handle people that messed up the semverse spec in release labels, adding some character um, and wrote, you know, in the like wrote it to the registry or something, and we would still get through it. Although, if it's invalid, it would work either. Yeah, see, it probably works either way. No, no, the case is you ship a bundle with like, you know, dash A in it, and for whatever, or dash B in it, and for whatever reason, you ship the first version with dash A Octothorpe in it, right? And so... Well, I mean... Well, that, that's, in that case, we would... I think using bundles as examples is not a good idea because we would never allow that. Right. I mean, I could move two after three. I think it'd be. Don't think it changes. I don't know how many. I don't know how many people are, would actually hit that. Yeah. Um, try two after three, and see if it works or doesn't work well as you're going through it. I guess I, I let's try that. All right, let's try two after three and see if that how that turns out. Um. Because right now I have this slight, you know, how does Bob say it? A plus zero, but that's going to work out slightly better than the invalid before the release labels. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, it's going to be moving like one line of code yeah, down I, I, two lines or something. Right. <laughs> yeah, but I think we'll see it like if in the unit test, I think we'll be able to see it. Like, look, these things compare and these things don't compare um, or whatever. All right, I want to bring up one – or sorry, before we move on, does that – did that get all of the – do we evaluate the space fully, Sean? I think there's one question, the burn. Like, I had to basically remove some comparisons that it was making before. Because it was treating it, treating it as a number, it was able to do some comparisons that don't make sense anymore. Oh, okay. What is this? What was this one? Oh, it was coerced and... I think they were... Well, I think those were... I think one was like comparing high, one was comparing low, I want to say. The, what do you mean high? Comparing high. The high word? The high word. Oh, so it's comparing yeah. just the major minor? That's really weird. So this um, one is... It does have from the side that. packages, right? To differentiate between major upgrades and minor upgrades. I don't know. Well, no, major or minor upgrades are should be found by the yeah. product code being the same and the version numbers being different, right? Or something? Yeah, I think yeah, okay. I think that's I think it's more complicated than that. I, I so, yeah, one one is the high word, one is the low word, and the other one is just doing a bitwise and. <laughs> that anybody want to anyone want to bet that that's a Frederick just making shit up? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> um, making stuff up. I I can't I don't ever remember discussing the behavior of those as ever a thing. Um, MSI doesn't do anything for versions. Does MSI do anything like that for numbers for those things? I mean, is that, it could be that that's what like MSI does in its uh, condition syntax. Condition syntax MSI. Um, you don't have that shortcut? 
shortcut it? No. Because I know I can find it like this. Yeah. Um, where are my operators? Left string bitwise numeric. Where's the numeric? Comparative operators, logical. There's nothing numeric? All right, now I just... What? Sure, That's you can find it. No, it's, it's doing a bitwise on it. True if the high 16 bits of the left integer are equal to the right integer. Wow. Yeah. So, all right. So I'm going to take what I said bad about Frederick, and he actually implemented the spec probably for it, uh, which was, well, the operator says it's the high bit, so I can do that. Um, is it the high 16 or the high 32 of the version? Anyway. Um yeah, I don't know if those make any sense anyway. Like, what does that mean? Well, the, before it would have been the major minor versus the patch and revision. Okay. But you had to make them numbers? Oh, no, it, it would be able to coerce a version into a number and then still do the comparison? So you'd be able to say... Well, I mean, before I did this, it, it was a number. It was just a deal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. So it could do that. So it could compare two versions. And there would be a way for you to say v3.0.1 uh, greater, greater v3.0 or something. and it, or equal, But then it would be equal. Oh, God, what? Does, <laughs> Actually, anybody... it doesn't make sense because it, it used to be a keyword. So that would have been... Yeah, it can't be 16, oh. right? It had to be... I'm hoping it was 32. But but then, yeah, where are you going to get – how are you going to get in an MSI condition, where are you going to come up with the 32-bit value that represents 3.0? Well, not – not it, this, this is burn, not MSI. So it's whatever we defined in burn, and Sean's basically saying, you know, these operators. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 4.0, we can make breaking changes and pretend that we never did never that. Did these operators? Yes. Maybe um, that uh, that just that seems really weird. <laughs> yeah, I'm not against that. The, the other option, Sean, would be to take the, the four dotted versions and turn them into a keyword and then do this operator like 3 did, right, and ignore all the release labels. I, I mean, I don't know what else to do. Right. Um, that, yeah, that would be the other thing. Good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think getting rid of these is fine. I mean, that's just it's just kooky um, when compared to a version. Yeah, like like Painter says, it doesn't even. Like I don't know if I've ever used it. So I mean, yeah. All right. Um, and then the coercions right below it. I'm sorry. The the two paragraphs right below that. So like when a version variable is coerced into a numeric value, then I just tried to parse the version string as a number, which will pretty much never work, but that's, you shouldn't be trying to coerce a version into a number anyway. And then when you're co coercing a number into a version, then it'll, it'll treat it as V3 did it, yeah. as a keyword. Yeah. I think you could treat them both as the way that V3 did it coercing into a number, I mean, yeah, it, oh, I mean, yeah, it, do it, what did V3 do when you try to take a, oh, you had a Q word, so it, yeah, it could have turned into a very big number, or whatever, right. or a very small number, I guess it was zero, zero, zero. Um, um, I don't know, a lot of me is inclined to just say, yeah, if you take a number, then we just we ignore your release labels and toss your number, and there's your number. I, the the four dotted versions that go, yeah, there's your number. Um, and just be like, there you go. That's what it is. The same as what Wix 3 is, I guess. Ignoring all the new stuff. Well, there's always a chance. Well, in V3, there a coercion, well, a version coercion, ooh, I like that, um, can always succeed. We're saying now in V4 that might fail, which is generally true of coercions, anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's fine. If you can, you can. If you can't, you can't. 
I mean, the other problem is in V4, we've expanded. So, like, the major oh, can, be, can be way too big. Yeah, you're right. It may fail. But, yeah, that number can't turn into a number. And then what do you get? Not a number? I don't know what you get. Well, you get a type conversion error. Okay. All right, fine. It's already in there. Okay, yeah, I'm, I think that's fine. It's like try, but if it doesn't work, then... Yeah, if you can't turn it into a keyword, you can't turn it into a keyword in Arabic. It's like, yeah, oh, okay, fine. I'm using the advanced stuff I wasn't using as a keyword anyway. I mean, if you're, you should be, I don't know why you were ever trying to get a number from a version before anyway. Yeah, that's just wrong. Yeah. Yeah, let's go with that, and we'll see what happens. All right, so now have we covered everything? Because I want to ask one more thing, and then we're going to wrap up today. Um, yeah, I think that's it. All right, so the last thing I want to bring up is actually what Bob brought up with minor upgrades. The Windows installer actually supports semantic versioning, kind of, if you allow the dash to be a dot because the Windows installer does not evaluate everything after the first three versions. You can actually put 1.0.0. string as you could with Semver. Now the Windows installer will not evaluate that, but the Windows installer doesn't evaluate that 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 last part anyway, and so you can't use that semantic part, you know, the the fourth part of the version in Windows Installer for major upgrades, but we could, if we accepted it, use it for minor upgrades, which means you would allow, if we allowed the dot as that separator there, that would allow you to do semantic versioning with MSIs for minor upgrades. And burn. And, and because burn is a thing that evaluates minor upgrades, it would it should all work correctly, because burn would be like, hey, I see that version, I see the MSI version, compare them. Hey, there's a string part of this. I will do semantic versioning rules on it, figure out if it's an upgrade or not, and then do the appropriate minor upgrade scheduling. But only burn. But only burn. This. Well, minor upgrades require an outside thing to trigger the minor up to to execute the minor upgrade anyway. Uh, you can't double click on an MSI and get a minor upgrade. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, but you can run the command line. I'm saying that that behavior would not... Well, okay, a minor upgrade it would still work, right? Because what you're saying is the um, a minor upgrade would require one of the first three version fields to change. No, one, no, the minor upgrade could be newer if the string part even changed. Well, that would not work for MSI. It would no longer be a minor upgrade. A small update would keep the version number the same. Presumably, the normal rules about the first three parts, or sorry, the, the rules about the fourth part being ignored would still apply. Though, yeah, of course, it, that's not defined. No, I think it's yeah, I think it'll still be recognized in a minor upgrade. Not if the first three version fields don't change. That sure defines. About that? Yes, that defines a minor. The version number has to change in a minor upgrade. It has to change. Yeah. Oh, of course. Now that I've said it with utter confidence, am I wrong? I think a small update does not change the version number. A minor upgrade does. Yeah, but I don't think there's anything different between those in the command line that you execute and the behavior of the Windows install. Uh, well, um, yeah, I, I guess I would agree with that. So, but, so at but, that point, the words small update and minor upgrade are synonymous, and the only difference is the semantics of changing the product version and yada, yada, yada. So here well, I'm... No, hold, no I'm, I'm suggesting that, that MSI might care. Yeah, I don't think it does. A minor upgrade changes the product version property. So I was right there. You have to change one of... Uh, 
<laughs> you have to change the product version. Would it count if it's in the fourth place? I don't know, but it it, it has in my all my experiences because that's how I often do my upgrades is changing that fourth place because Burn respects it. Yeah. Well, I I guess yeah, I'm... See, I I agree with Painter. I don't think for my experience is it doesn't care. It mm-hmm. does not change its behavior. The Windows installer internally does not change its behavior. It's just doing a recache reinstall for all intents and purposes. I think it's a little weird to suggest that it's a minor upgrade if it's actually a small update. Fine. So it's a small update in the Windows installer, but it's it can be done through semantic versioning if we allow that dot to come through. Negative one. Moving on. <laughs> so you want to change the spec to be able to allow a pre-release label if it's just three dots? You can put whatever you want in the last, in the fourth field. I don't, I, not, a, not whatever you want, but a, a label. The, I was tossing the idea you, out. You that, can put a pre-release label in right, you the could fourth put a, field. Right, you could put a pre-release label in the fourth field. If we allowed that, then the Windows installer, you would be able to write Windows install MSIs that um, were versioned via semantic versioning inside, and Burn would respect the versioning correctly. So I guess, what's the details on that? So can you put a dash something after that? Or can you put a plus on the end? I don't know. You can put been a long time since I verified it, but I'm pretty certain you can put number dot number dot number dot any string, and I'm not validated what characters are not allowed in there. Yeah, right. Is is, is there a goal you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, semantic versioning and MSIs, but maybe I'm trying to get it for small updates, which isn't worth it. But well, you're not getting it for major upgrades. Yeah, and it will not work for and major upgrades. Given that's ninety percent of the world, I just I, I I'm not seeing a big win here. I'm not seeing a minor win, to be honest. But if it's not going to work for major upgrades, so what's the point? Well, if people have been using it like this, I don't know. I doubt anybody's been using it like this. Most well, because well, one, I don't think Wix will let you do it today. No, it won't. Unless you use bind time variables. <laughs> um, even then, we might get it. But yeah, I, I haven't tried. Um, but I know you, you can edit it. But... Sure. So anyway, I, I wanted to put that out there. Bob is obviously allergically reacting to it <laughs> as not having enough value. because, it, and, and the point is not wrong, is that... Um, Small updates, minor upgrades are very rare, and so I can I understand the questioning how much value, how much effort to put into it. I just wanted to toss it out as the as Burn is doing this. If we considered the dot string as another way of doing release label, so instead of only dash, just, you know, extending it a little bit to support MSI as an idea. That's that's okay. where I was going with it. I think that's where my allergies come from. It's it's extending it, you know, by breaking one of the rules and then only doing it, you know, for a, a small subset of cases. It's just it's like yeah. plus I do think you're you're probably asking for trouble given that we don't know how MSI interprets and and records the various kinds of updates. Are small updates and minor upgrades literally the same thing? Okay, maybe. I don't know. (laughs) But also, I'm allergic to 
taking on a new concept um, when we're trying to ramp down and you know ship stuff. But fair enough. My my hope was always to kind of when we had all this working, and so Sean seized on the the error of dealing with versions out there that do not adhere to the four dot that has tripped up burn in the past. And he had, he mm -hmm. latched onto that error, which I think was fantastic. I always had this subversive idea of being able to do some semver through MSI kind of bubbling in the background as it went along, which is why I didn't bring it up until the very end <laughs> when everything else was in set. Like, this is just an idea of could we support it because I don't, because I don't know. It looks, my test had it working when I did it admittedly quite a while ago, um, that I, you know, had an A and a B and they deployed just fine <laughs> and the minor upgrades worked um, for a very small MSI to have a file and things like that. So that's all it was coming from. Um, and it is a, uh, a small enhancement to the spec. So that's where I was kind of coming from. Anyway. Sure. Okay. So I'll leave that there as an interesting thought experiment, and we will we will not worry about it right now, um, and move on with I think the answers for everything else. Yes, Sean. Yep. All right. Ooh. Um, that was awful. <laughs> now I know why we couldn't get that right <laughs> in email. Um, I said this at the beginning of this. Uh, call, but I do think 5377 will go smoother. <laughs> um, um, so we will pick up that one next time, next week, uh, or sorry, two weeks, not next week, two weeks from now. Um, and then we will probably get to uh, one of those. Uh, I expect we will get to two next week. And I say that knowing that that's a good way to ensure that we don't. Well, 5377 might be something that we can actually do over email. I don't think it's that controversial. Um, okay. I mean, I say that because no one's replied to either of my mails about it. Yeah, well, I've, I've yeah, I know. Um, all right. Anything else anybody else wants to talk about besides me not responding to emails on Wix does right now? Uh, <laughs> anything no, else? No, no, that's good enough. On a 3.14 release, 3.14 releases, uh, if it releases, is is tied to Wix 4.0, and so it will contain all the things that help you move from a 3.11 build to a Wix 4.0 build. And there has been discussions that maybe we won't have an official 3.14 release. It'll always just be a build you can grab to help you move your way to 4.0. Um, there is no 3.14 release planned at this time, and it will be sometime after the 4.0 release as we work through more and more things as people try to adopt four of things that we have to do in 3.14 to help them move. I don't know what those are, so it's very hand wavy right now, but that's the update on 3.14 releases, is that it is tied to the 4.0. Its purpose is to help you get to 4.0. Merge modules, so how's 4.0 coming? Merge modules work? If you go back, you can see that that um, we have gone through the last few weeks of triage, going through what we think are preview zero issues. That list is marked, uh, how's it, Bob? Wix 4.0 preview zero as a word, I think. Um, 4.0 like preview zero. 4.0 preview zero. Um, as a label, you can see that list. That list going to zero tells us that 4.0 preview zero will be in a good spot. That gets out the command line tools and gets the core set of things that people can then experiment with and start bidding on the important parts of the tool set, which is generating MSIs and um, bundles. Um, you can build things already and try it out if you want. Um, that should work. Merge modules do work. Bundles do work. Um, everything we think generally works. What's not working? Validation's not working. And there's, you know, and bugs that uh, we have open that are known. So you can always get a build now um, of it, and um, we are working our way towards preview zero. I don't have a timeline on that um, right now. I'm still working on scheduling, but a lot of my scheduling is getting a little, hopefully coming a little more clarity, and then you know, that's just time, fixing all the bugs amongst all the other things that we do. So 
before overall you can you know get a build out of it and work with it and it does a lot of the things that you would expect Wix to do and has some bugs when you try to do certain things. All right, if that's it, anything else? All right, so um, until two weeks, right? Two weeks, I was trying to figure out. Uh, two weeks is the 15th. That seems like a normal date. Wait, are we actually going to end up on, no, 15th and then 29th. All right, we're not going to be that close to Halloween this year. Not that Halloween is a major I don't know, holiday, but there we go, especially with Especially the, when in a pandemic. I know, especially when everybody's in tourists. Yeah, we had a big discussion in my neighborhood going so, and I have one of the few families that have kids that are at trick-or-treating age. We have little ones that are barely walking, and we have older ones that are in high school or above, so you're like, how many people are actually going to go trick-or-treating? I'm like, I don't know. We might go walk around and wave because <laughs> my kids will be dressed up because we're trying to keep some sort of normalcy, but you know, we're certainly not going to any Halloween parties. Anyway, on that happy note, uh, we will be back uh, in two weeks on October 15th. Two weeks, same time, same place. We'll do this all again. Until then, you guys uh, take it easy. Bye. Bye. Bye.